Welcome to this edition of American Purpose. My name is Jack Moline. I am the president of Interfaith Alliance. 60 years ago, Henry Luce, the publisher of Life magazine, invited 10 prominent men, each to compose an essay on the national purpose. Then as now, there was a sense that we stood at the beginning of a time of cultural and political change. Our project expands on this work as each episode explores one perspective, or in our case today, two perspectives, on where our nation was, where it is, and where it should be heading with a contemporary thought leader. My guests are from the world of faith, government, politics, and culture, and they have generously agreed to share this time with us. You can find out more about Interfaith Alliance and our mission to protect your faith and freedom at interfaithalliance.org and by listening to our radio program and podcast, State of Belief, at stateofbelief.com. But right now, let's find out more about the American purpose with my guests, Whit Ayers and Stan Greenberg, two of the uh, most accomplished and uh, and respected pollsters in the United States. And for those of you who might not be familiar with one or, or both of these gentlemen, let me uh, make clear that uh, Witt's uh, approach to polling mostly comes from a Republican perspective and stands mostly from a Democratic perspective, but they're honest brokers on each side. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, I did to be here. Thank you, guys. With Jack. this uh, disgraced profession. So you know, I know that uh, most of this disgraced profession. <laughs> <laughs> most of the time, you're asked to uh, to talk about what other people are thinking, uh, but it's put you in sort of a catbird seat to to get some sense of what uh, the American ethos is at any given moment. So uh, I'm I'm glad we can sort of mine that long view that you have, as well as some of the shorter understandings you have of our our situation right now. In your opinion, we'll start with you, Wit. What what was the national? What was the original national purpose of the United States? Well, Jack, it's a pleasure to be with you, and pleasure to be with Stan. Stan and I have done a number of joint surveys uh, for NPR, so it's good to be back with him again. Most of what I have to say, Jack, about the fundamental American purpose rests on four basic values that, at least in my mind, represents what this country tries to be and at its best uh, becomes. Uh, the first is individual liberty, that freedom to say, act, worship as we please, relatively free of government restraint. The second is the rule of law and equality before the law for all individuals. The third is equality of opportunity, uh, the ability to rise based on our talents, our initiative, our efforts, and not our heritage or class or background. Uh, that's what really separates us from so much of Europe. And I, I think of uh, a young, uh, illegitimate child who was an immigrant to America who became one of the most celebrated Americans of all time, Alexander Hamilton, who represents in one person that whole ideal which is so completely different from most European countries. And the fourth value is governance through democratic Republican institutions, where the will of the people is paramount and where our elected officials are the servants of the people, not their masters. Most of what I'll say in the course of this discussion springs from one of those four foundational values. And I sort of get the impression that that the three, uh, the last three values really support the first, this notion of individual liberty and fulfillment. Yes. Great. Thank you. Stan, how would you describe the original national purpose of the United States? We have a lot of overlap, but 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 also some other areas of uh, where we're not. But uh, but I also start uh, with Jefferson, and uh, and uh, and what Jefferson formulated, but also what the Jeffersonian Democrats also tried to forge um, in the first uh, 25 years, and how much that shaped um, what was coming. So uh, I view it as a country where all men and women are created equal. Um, as an obviously as an aspiration, um, but it's a, a 
a powerful point, and if one thinks about it, it's so unimaginable at that moment in time um, that one would be putting to paper um, that all men are created uh, created equal as a, again an aspiration for the country. Uh, it was also a democracy or republic, a republic or uh, develop, emerging to a democracy, but above all, uh, people being able to hold its leaders accountable um, who were not uh, living by those uh, principles. And it was also a country of immigrants. Uh, and this was actually one of the initial battles, um, you know, between Jefferson and, uh, and Hamilton and others, uh, and Adams and others, on whether we had, whether we were open to immigration. And in fact, we had no immigration laws um, for a century. And so from the very beginning, uh, America was under these principles, uh, wide open um, and accepting uh, immigrants from all across the world who accepted those first principles. So uh, here's, here's what I garner from what you just said, Stan, is that things have changed over the course of, of the years oh. in terms of, of how we perceive what some of our foundational approaches are. So having said that, would, would either of you, and this time we'll start with you, Stan, would either of you say that, that there is a different American purpose or an additional Mer American purpose moving forward from this point where we are right now? I actually go back to the, I mean, I, I, I think both, both of us would go back to the starting, you know, principles. I think we're lost, you know, without this. And, and, and at every point, and if you look at, if we look at Lincoln, if we look at Martin Luther King, at, at, at all points, you know, people look at how much, the, what a huge gap there was for the good Obama's book, uh, most recent book. There's such an enormous gap between where we are and what's intervened and getting to those first principles. But I think the country continues to have that national purpose. And if, if we can't affirm that, uh, we won't have that common first purpose. And then I think we're lost. Whit, would you agree? I agree with Stan. I think those four values that I laid out remain our national purpose. Uh, it goes without saying that we have never fully accomplished any of those four, uh, but with their, that we're continually striving. And I think a continual effort to try to live up to the hope and the promise of those four fundamental values remains our national purpose. So some of our foundational values are admirable, and some, perhaps those unarticulated, are not always so admirable. Um, if you were to name one or maybe two values that are worth doubling down on now to propel us forward out of these uncertain times, what would they be? Whit? Well, I think I go back to those four that I already mentioned. I mean, I, I think they have laid the foundation for a society of enormous progress and enormous promise. Uh, and so... I, I would simply go back to those four and, and say trying to reach the hope and the promise of each of them remains uh, what we should focus on and concentrate on. Can you, can you suggest something that might be a step toward that, that, uh, that we might want to lift up right now? Jack, I think Monday, December 14th, is going to go down in, in at least recent American history as a red letter day, as, as a, a day of enormous triumph. Uh, it was the triumph of our democratic republican institutions after a number of years of assault and threat. Uh, a whole lot of Americans across this country did their jobs and did their duty and they upheld the second principle, which was the rule of law. Uh, at the same day, we had the first vaccine for COVID-19 administered, which was the triumph of our scientific genius, not just in this country, but around the world. Uh, and the hope that science can help us make progress against this dread disease in record time. So an electoral college, 
sustaining our democratic republican institutions and the triumph of science all in the same day is i think a a, a momentous day in recent american history yeah i don't think you could write that into a work of fiction and have yeah. it believed <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Stan, um, what are you I'll, I'll, say? I will, uh, I'll, I'll cheer those. Uh, I, like, I think we uh, there's like two there's two fundamental gaps between our starting principles and where we are now. One has to do with the huge inequality of wealth uh, and power, uh, and the, the gap is only growing. And the and so the biggest. There's, I would say there's two, I'm actually talking about three gaps, but the, am I allowed? Anyway, but for me, the first is we have such a unequal, corrupt society, um, and we have to use politics um, to address you know, both of those, probably together. The fact that we have a rigged politics, you can't have, uh, you can't have the kind of equality as aspiration unless you confront that. You know, second uh, has to do with our racial uh, legacy, uh, and it is it is so profound. The history is just builds on atop itself, and it's played out during the period of the COVID um, that people become conscious through what's happened with you know police brutality, through what happened in that process. Many, many American Black Lives Matter still has an overall positive image in the country, despite everything. Because I think people understand there's a history to be addressed, uh, which creates huge, not burden, huge challenge uh, for leaders and, and government to address, or not even close, I think, to coming to terms with it. And the third has to do with kind of the individualism and, and materialism at a time when we're dealing with climate change. And you have to f figure out how it is with those values. Uh, we come to terms with that huge challenge, which will only grow deeper. So I come out of this going back to first principles. And still, even in thinking about these three areas, uh, but they, the gap has created huge challenges for our institutions, for our Constitution, um, and for the American people. So I, I, I can't help but do a little compare and contrast here, right. that while the two of you are in pretty much complete agreement on, on what we're talking about here, Whit, you seem to approach this from more from the point of view of the individual and, and his or her place in society. And Stan, I hear you talking uh, more about the society and its impact on the individual. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Oh, I, I completely agree with Stan uh, on the mm. gaps that we have and the, the challenges that we have remaining. Uh, I don't know that we're that different in our in our fundamental analysis yeah. of our of our society and its challenges. We've always had challenges. We've had mm -hmm. race as America's original sin, and we will continue to battle that one. The growing inequality of wealth is uh, a function of trends that have been going on at least for 50 years. I think of Charles Murray's Coming Apart book about the challenges facing at least white communities between the people who are better off and, and those who are not. Um, but we've had the malefactors of great wealth in Franklin Roosevelt's phrase uh, going back uh, at least 100 years uh, or beyond. So we, we've had those challenges. And then, of course, Stan mentioned climate change, which is a newer one. Uh, but they are, they are major challenges facing our society. Uh, but they, they don't change the fundamental purpose of the country, in my view. Stan? I'm, I'm in agreement. I mean, I, on each of these areas, I go back to the individual. I mean, you have to have individual equality and, and opportunity. Um, for me, community is a means rather than an end. And, uh, and I think, in, in some sense, we come back to the same place. It's dangerous. <laughs> I, uh, I heard Senator Tim Kaine once talk about um, 
about uh, this notion of equality in this country. And, and he pointed out that Thomas Jefferson, for all of his uh, vaunted language in the Declaration of Independence about the equality of humanity and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as fundamental uh, rights that people had, he was unable to get it uh, memorialized in the Constitution. It took until Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address to declare that we're a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal. And so it's, it's clear that there is some, uh, there is some uh, uh, efforts that continue to, to be necessary in order to enable us to realize uh, the, the intent of our better angels. I, I, I want to move on just a little bit, and we don't, and we haven't discussed gender in all this because uh, at, at at every point we've left out women, uh, and, yes. and on and on the Fourteenth Amendment, it took a, a, a later interpretation of the Fourteenth Amendment um, to get to equ equality for women, and it was debated at the time, and it was debated at the time of the Civil Rights Laws uh, that we, that equality for women at each point was pushed off. And we're still having a debate over the Equal Rights Amendment, whether that's the right remedy or not. Um, it's only taken 38 years to uh, to come to a point where we can talk about whether it whether it should be accepted or not. So, listen, most of our constitutional guarantees emphasize our commonality, and, and we've talked about that. But the very first freedom in the Bill of Rights is very personal. It is religion. It is freedom of conscience. What values that are rooted in your own personal belief system do you commend to those who do not share your personal beliefs? And I'll, I'll point out here that, that Witt is a Christian, Stan is a Jew. You can def define yourselves mm -hmm. in terms of your relationship to the theologies of the communities you belong to as you choose. But uh, what is unique about what you've gleaned from your experience that you think is commendable for all Americans? It seems to me, Jack, that the way we get along, the way we treat each other is rooted in those foundational values. The whole idea of democratic Republican institutions <laughs> implies a certain respect for the views and perspectives of those who think differently. Uh, it, it demands a certain meeting of the minds and meeting in the middle, uh, and it basically implies that you're not going to get everything you want because of the way we structured those institutions. Uh, I am a Christian, I come from a long line of Presbyterian ministers, uh, and yet they were people who valued the the discussion and the perspectives and the faith of, of others. And I, I think that's fundamental to being an American citizen, is that we respect the values and the, the perspectives and the ideas of others, and we are expected to treat them with respect. Stan? Okay. No, I start, first of all, I start on the same point. I'm actually not sure I see the conflict, because I thought there was a starting pluralism that was acknowledged at the very beginning at, in the drafting in the Constitution, the Federalist Papers. I mean, pluralism was essential to the whole project and their and their belief that this could survive because of that. Tyranny would not come back because of this being a pluralistic country, religion being a critical part of that pluralism. And so I just I view religion as just, you know, not, you know, something at odds with those principles as something that's just part of that diversity uh, that makes it, you know, durable. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, uh, was raised in uh, Jewish uh, faith, and and what I lived with in the period when I grew up in the 50s in uh, in Washington, um, and, and later in the Montgomery Blair High School in Montgomery County and uh, in Maryland, but I I watched my fellow students, and I watched coming out of the uh, out of the synagogues, going to join the civil rights, going to join the march on Washington, going to join the civil rights marches, uh, which paralleled one's religious faith. At, at that point, they you know those were simultaneous. So the idea of fighting for equality very much was grounded in my faith, which I viewed as just part of America's uh, pluralism and and us being an immigrant country. Great, thank you. 
how should our society pursue our national purpose? Uh, and I, I know you'll both say you're coming back to the original principles that you articulated <laughs> at the beginning, but can you make some suggestions as to steps we can take to pursue what we ought to be all about? Jack, I'm a former civics teacher, having taught eighth grade civics way, way, way early in my career. Uh, and I, I'm a continual believer that we cannot live up to our national purpose if we don't understand our national purpose and we don't understand our governmental institutions. Uh, I think a continual effort to try to educate, to try to communicate, and, and try to make sure that Americans understand some of those things we were just talking about, the critical nature of respecting others and respecting their views and not assuming that we have a corner on truth. Uh, as a former educator, I continually go back to the vital importance of education for a healthy civic society. I mean, we're so polarized. We're so polarized that people are so conscious of, of the that Democrats and Republicans are, you know, are at war with each other, uh, literally. And, and people are fearful of it. And the I think we I think we grab even more firmly onto these principles because I don't I don't see how we get to a better future unless we start there. Good. How about the individual? What is the individual's role in pursuing the national purpose? And before you say everybody should go out and vote, we'll just <laughs> assume that as, uh, as, as the bottom line. But, but what can you and I and anybody who's listening and, and viewing this do to move the national purpose forward? Stan, we'll start with you. <laughs> so let's um, look, it's, it's, there's so little empathy, there's so little understanding of, of either side, which is ongoing. I mean, I I was listening to focus groups in Georgia, uh, you know, last night uh, for a respectability a group of people with disabilities, and they are of both parties. <laughs> and there was such need for government to be responsive, particularly now during COVID and all the issues they face. And the and the kind of on you know on, on both sides, why can't they kind of understand? Why can't they see the individual? And why can't they have charity? Why can't they have empathy? And you know, I do think there was a a, a common purpose that transcends religion um, that can appeal to them. We are, as Stan says, so incredibly polarized. We are living in communities where we rarely confront someone who thinks differently than we do about politics. We have we seek out uh, media that reinforces our pre-existing views rather than challenges them. Uh, we have social media, which is too often a cesspool of vitriol that gives voice to the loudest and most extreme elements of our society. What, one of the things I think we can do as individuals is to constantly seek out sources of information and people to talk to who don't think like we do. Uh, I, I think you, you find sometimes if you sit down and just talk to people and try to understand where they come from without you know, judging their motives, or castigating their motivations, you can find a, a lot more in common than you might have thought previously. But we do that so rarely that we continue to drift farther and farther apart as a society. So I think one of the things that we all should do as individuals is constantly seek out alternative points of view and people who may differ from us just to make sure that we don't get so much in a silo that we're reinforcing our own views and beliefs and prejudices all the time. So I've certainly been able to model this by having the two of you on this uh, last half hour conversation <laughs> here. And we haven't thrown anything at each other. It's incredibly Not yet. Simple. Not yet, at least. I have nothing but respect for women. Hmm. 
Yes, so I, I do stand. I have I have one last question for each of you. Stan, we'll we'll start with you, and then Wit. And um, I've been getting very interesting responses to this. Here's the question: Are you optimistic about America's future? I am programmed to be optimistic, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's sort of it's sort of my outlook on the world. You, it, you need I'm, to let him answer last, because I because <laughs> I am. Not so optimistic in the short term because I think we actually are in uh, in an unfinished battle um, to which has to, has to has a couple of years to play itself out. Uh, but you know, but I but I think America does have a purpose and a future. You know, and I and I you know I look at places like Georgia and which are producing surprising politics. But I you know you look at this diverse. You know, incredibly diverse. Uh, you know, you know, country that's, you know, el electing black leaders uh, in the South, um, and, and which voting trends are, you know, changing dramatically um, across groups you would not expect. And I think we're going to look at kind of the Georgias and the Arizonas and say how they work, how the, how they work out America's problem is who we will look to to lead the country. Jack, I think that if you look at America in a broader perspective, uh, it helps to retain that sense of optimism. Progress is not the absence of problems. We are always going to have problems. Problem, the, uh, progress is whether we would rather have our set of problems today or the problems we had yesterday. We have terrorism that we're facing, but I would rather face the problem of terrorism than the problem of mutually assured destruction, which was the situation facing America and the Soviet Union when the three of us were young. Um, we have a horrible, horrible pandemic. But if you have a sense of history and you read about the 1918, 1919 flu pandemic, we are going to get out of it much faster with far less death than we did back a hundred years ago with the last major pandemic. So if you look at America with a broader perspective, I, I think it, it can help us retain a sense of optimism that this is a remarkably adaptable country with remarkably gifted people and a remarkable set of foundational values so that I in the long run, am very optimistic about this country continuing to thrive. That's uh, in the long run, we're not all dead. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you add up our ages on, on this program, it's pretty much the history of America. Pretty close <laughs> to it. <laughs> pretty close. Cool. It's, it's good to know that after all of that time, there's still uh, there's still a perspective ahead of us that is positive. Stan Greenberg and Whit Ayers, I cannot thank you enough for spending thank time you, with me today and with our, our viewers and listeners. And uh, uh, I conclude with, uh, with just these few words that I want to offer my thanks to my guests and, and I want to offer thanks to our listeners for engaging with us in exploring the American purpose. It's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with Stan Greenberg and Whit Ayers, who shared their perspective so generously. You can listen to this and other episodes at AmericanPurpose.org and learn more about our work at StateOfBelief.com and InterfaithAlliance.org. Interfaith Alliance has produced this program under the guidance of Ray Kirstein. I am Jack Moline, encouraging you to live with purpose.